Buenos dias, Madrid. No habla español. So that's about what I can speak Spanish. So unfortunately, I'm going to do the presentation in English, but I hope you can follow anyway. My name is Joachim Avestin. I work as the head of innovation for Sabre Travel Network in EMEA. And I think it's safe to say that I have one of the most fun jobs in the world because I get to touch and experiment with much of the latest technology and think about how can we take this fantastic technology, bring it back into travel and create sensible applications and services for the future travelers. So I think a lot about five to seven to ten years ahead. So today I want to share with you some of the things that I've been thinking about over the past year. And I want to start with this quote. Because the future is here already. We have so much technology around us, but this technology might not be distributed. What do I mean with that? I will make an example. I used to work for Scandinavian Airlines. And back in 2007, they introduced biometric check-in, which means that when I would come to the check-in desk, I would put my finger down, and that finger would be my boarding pass as well as I came to the gate. Now, this technology is not around anymore. And you know why? Because it's, it's not only about the technology, it's about the people that are going to use the technology. So what Scandinavian Airlines found was that it would actually take longer to use something that you carry with you all the time than a mobile boarding pass or a paper boarding pass because people would forget whether they used the left hand finger or the right hand finger. So to summarize, the technology is there, but it's still humans and persons that are going to use it. I don't like to show graphs, but this graph is really for you to get the feeling of how fast does technology happen today, and specifically, how fast does tech adaption happen today. So if you look at it to the very far left, the phone took up to 45 years to go from 10% adoption rate in the U United States to 90% adoption rate. The tablet, or sorry, the, uh, the smartphone took six years, the tablet three years. And if we go back for a while to the smartphone, this is only in the United States. It took six years to go from 10% to 90%. Now, this adoption is already happening all over the place. And in fact, there's over one million new smartphone users every single day in the world. And that's three times the amount of babies being born every day. Pretty amazing number. Smartwatches hasn't reached 10% yet, but it's super important for us as a company like Sabre to keep an eye on these trends because as you can see, when, they, when it hits the 10%, it's too late for us to start thinking about it. So if we hadn't had access to the Apple Watch long before it was available to the public, we wouldn't have been able to release our Tripcase application for Apple Watch on launch date. So as the previous speaker, he, he talked about the future. So I've picked the date maybe eight years from now in 2024, Future Tech 2024. So we're going to use that as a theme for the rest of the presentation, where I'm going to go through some of the tech clusters, if you may, that we've been looking at over the past year. Before we do that, let me remind you of how it looked like eight years ago. So 2008. What did the tech world look like? How did we communicate with each other, with travel providers? So I can tell you that in 2008, Apple released their second generation iPhone, which had the first App Store. App Store, that is something that we take for granted today. In September 2008, Google announced that they were going to release something called Android a brand new mobile operating system for smartphones. So no Android phones, no Airbnb, no Uber, no Netflix. Netflix was the coolest movie rental company because they would actually send DVD discs to your home and you could send them back when you had watched it. They did have streaming services, but a very, very, very low adaption. 
this has changed dramatically because Netflix is one of the companies that made a big company like Blockbusters go bust because people are not using physical disks. Everything is online today. So eight years ago, doesn't seem very long, but in eight years, there's been so much evolution. And today, it's a completely different way of how we communicate between each other and between the companies that we do business with. So as I said before, technology is fantastic, but you have to remember, in our line of business, we have to remember that the services and applications we create are gonna be used by humans. And in a very near future, future, these guys, the children, will be the next generation travelers. So what do children do? They play. This is the latest version of the Barbie doll. Very advanced technology. It has a built-in Wi-Fi chip, so the child can actually speak to the doll. The doll will talk back, and it's so advanced that the parents can actually sign up for a summary of what the child has been talking to their doll about, so they can replay whatever conversations. And why do I have a Barbie doll on the screen? Because the way the children play today is also the way that they will expect future services and applications to work. And specifically this generation called Generation Zero. These are people born in 1995 and onwards. Incredibly busy infographic, but I wanna highlight four things that I think will be very, very important to think about when we design applications for the future. First of all, as uh, the guy earlier mentioned, time spent on technology. Today, the average person would spend three to four hours a day. This generation is already spending over 10 hours a day on tech devices, and that tells us, presumably, the cell phone or the smartphone will still be very, very central, even in travel. The second thing, the average person in the workforce today uh, about 25% has a higher level of education in terms of MBA or university degree. Generation Zero is forecasted that every other person will have a higher, some sort of higher education, which also tells us that the expectations of the applications and services that we think about is going to be so much higher. Thirdly, previous generations, um, Generation X that I am, was very much verbal. We used to discuss and elaborate on things. Generation Zero is all about visual. It's all about images. It's all about what we call instant gratification. I want it now or I don't want it at all. And also instant consumption. If you think about applications such as Snapchat, you take a picture, send it to your friend, the friend sees it, the picture is gone. They don't save anything, they stream when they want, and if they don't get it when they want it, they're not interested. So that's a really good reason why Amazon in the United States, they now offer same-day delivery, because they know that if they don't, this generation is lost. I want it now, or I don't want it at all. And lastly, just to be very simple with the life stages, you would say we will target children, we will target adults, in Generation Zero, you have up to five substages of adults. You have the young adults, you have the kippers, which are young adults working, but they still live at home with their parents. You have the proper adults, you have the career changers, and you have the downagers. So when you think about which, which subcategory of adults do we want to target, if I were to decide, I would target the kippers because they stay at home, they have a job, they probably don't pay much for, for room and board. So these are probably the guys with the most money to spend and also the, the ones that are most willing to spend money. And if you look at my t-shirt and this graph as well, it's a brand new world. This is Maslow's famous hierarchy of needs. You know, it's not only about food and shelter and love, it's also about Wi-Fi connection. It's about battery life. Because what would we do if we weren't connected to the internet? It's, it's, it's a cat catastrophe, isn't it? 
OK, so that was some theories around the people that are going to use the future services. So let's talk a little bit about the different techs, the different clusters of technology that we and I believe will have an impact on the way we think about travel. So first of all, we have smartwatches, we have voice recognition, and we have biometric functionality. So let's start with smartwatches. About two years ago, I bought my first smartwatch. It was called a Pebble. If you know what Pebble is, it's one of the first iterations. Um, because it's my job to live and breathe tech, I had to put my Omega watch that I love dearly. I had worn it for 15 years. I put it in my closet and thought, I'm going to take it back after a week while I try this stuff out. So after a week, I thought, well, I'll give it another week. After two weeks, I put the Omega and put in the furthest in the back of my closet because this really, really changed my life. I, I, did, I wouldn't think it would, but with the notifications, with the, the smartwatches is using something called glanceable information. Glanceable information is something that you can glance at for one to two seconds, and it's enough information to have your brain decide whether it's a priority or not. So it's using something called the pre-attentive capabilities of the brain, where I can glance at something like looking what time it is, and then just continue to do whatever I'm doing in the foreground. So a complete game changer. For example, when I travel, I no longer stand around and look at the flight information boards, because that information is pushed to me at the moment that I need it. So there's no need for me to even worry about it. Now, if this doesn't work, I will probably not make my flight, because I'm so used to it. But it completely changes the way we think about travel, and also the opportunities for us to create really value-adding services when it comes to travel. Secondly, voice recognition. As you all know, the wearable devices are very small, so to type an email message or a text message on this device is close to impossible. So that tells us that voice recognition will be very, very important when it comes to the tech adoption of, of uh, wearable devices. We actually created a prototype for Google Glass a year and a half ago. And we ran some real-time tests in, in an airport, in Dallas Airport, where we have our head office. And the result was actually pretty high. It was 84% accuracy. So 84% of the times, we would get the result that we expected. And I thought that was kind of good. But then I thought about it again. So here's my smartphone. If, let's say that it wouldn't work 16% of the time I tried to do something, then I wouldn't use it. It would be useless to me. That's also why it's very important that voice recognition have to become better, because that's going to be one of the primary import, um, input controls for any kind of device. Finally, in this cluster, biometrics. I would say biometrics in smartwatches is what GPS was to the first versions of smartphones. And this is actually what is carrying the wearables today, because most of these devices have a biometric. This is a real-time shot from a presentation I did last summer in Las Vegas. Um, if you can see the small thing 19 minutes ago, 122 beats per minute, was when we realized that NASDAQ was tweeting the live video link to our presentation. And then in 19 minutes, I managed to get down to 114 beats per minute. So, and I can tell you, I have never measured my blood pressure so many times as the first week I had my Apple Watch. Second tech cluster, augmented reality and virtual reality. So augmented reality is exactly what it sounds like. You have a real video feed or a, or a picture, and you actually augment fictive stuff on, on, um, on top of that. This is from Google's version, Google Magic Leap. So as you move your hands around, the little elephant will jump in different directions. Pretty much like the floor there, where you move, it'll, it'll move with you. Microsoft obviously have a version called HoloLens. They took a bit of a different approach to it. So they said, this engineer here is designing a motorbike on the CAD CAM program. And as she turns to the left, she can see how the motorcycle will look like 
once it's fully assembled. And when they released the news about Microsoft HoloLens, they actually had a couple of travel related um, examples. This guy is looking for recipe while watching a football game while checking his, the weather forecast for his upcoming trip to Maui. Virtual reality. So virtual reality used to be all about creating virtual worlds, virtual people, and trying to make it look as real as possible. Now, in the past couple of years, this has switched completely. So now it's all about visiting real worlds, real people, but you do it virtually. A very good example of this is Marriott's campaign last year, where they had created custom pods with sound uh, natural elements as wind and mist. So they would invite people on the street to go visit their premium resorts all over the world, 100% virtual. Third tech cluster, autonomous vehicles or self-driving cars, Internet of Things, and dynamic personalization. I don't think any one of you have missed that Google is trying their best to make a self-driving car. And they're not far away, I can tell you that. But already we have a lot of autonomous features in the cars today. One really good example is BMW, a couple of weeks ago, announced that on their car key, they have a button that says, park my car, which in a very narrow space, you press this button, the car will park itself. Tesla re released, it's so new that I, I didn't even have time to put it in my presentation. They have released a functionality now that they're trying out. So if I'm on the other side of Madrid, I can call my car and say, come, come to me, and the car will drive itself to me. So I don't have to go out and look for it on the parking lot. It'll come to me. So today, when we talk about Internet of Things, it's not only the obvious things such as mobile phones and tablets and computers that are connected to the internet. It's also weird things like this. It's an air purifier. It's connected to the internet and it feeds information to a central data store. So that, start, that, that got me thinking about how can we leverage this phenomena in, in travel. So let's say that you have an intelligent fridge that orders drinks as they run low. They order milk when milk runs low. You have an air conditioning uh, unit that is connected to the internet. What if some of this information could be stored in your travel profile? So when I come to my hotel, I have the same temperature as I have at home in my air conditioning. What if the minibar is stocked with my favorite drinks because my travel profile knows that based on what my fridge is ordering for the local store? That would create a dynamic personalization with, that would ultimately increase the possibilities for me or, or would encourage me to buy because I would recognize it. I would feel more like home. Finally, what would a presentation without robots be? So just quickly, there are three, times, uh, three types of robots. There are operational robots, conversational, and recreational. First one, this is an image from Haneda Airport in Tokyo. In the front, it's a carrier robot. They put heavy boxes on it. It carries it around the airport for them. And it's not really clear here, but the guys in the back have uh, orange things on their hips. And that's something called exoskeletons, which is a form of robotic. So when they lift, they get extra power. So they can lift really heavy boxes, put it on the carrier robot, and the robot will carry the boxes for them. We have the conversational robots to the left, Amazon Echo, already there. It can order your favorite orders from Amazon, tell you the weather forecast, play your favorite music. To the right is something that is not out yet, but it's due to be out during this year. It's called the first personal home robot, the Jibo. Jibo recognizes your face. Um, of, of course, it can and, uh, take a selfie of you, but uh, something that is really cool is that because it recognizes your face, you can connect it to your home alarm system, for example. So as you enter the room, this can um, deactivate your alarm. As I said before, voice recognition will be super duper important to, uh, to uh, think about when we create and design the new services. 
For that reason, last year we created a prototype that sits on a website. I can ask the website a, a regular question, and then the website will actually show me a result and tell me the result in spoken language as well. So in this case, I'm going to ask my prototype, when is the first flight to Istanbul, and see what happens. Please wait whilst I load your results. The first flight is at 5.05 p.m. from KLM, but if you're willing to wait 55 minutes more, you could save £112.35 by flying with Turkish Airlines. So if you can imagine this without the uh, visual representation, let's say that I'm in my, in my car driving to the airport. My travel profile is preloaded, so the system knows that time is really important for me, but if there's a much cheaper alternative, I would like to have that read out to me as well. So by using this technology, we could actually create a fully automated booking solution based upon the travel preferences. Uh, just want to mention a hotel in Tokyo, or in, in Japan, that is 100% run by robots. So that's the operational robots, also the conversational robots. Uh, as you come in, you're greeted by a dinosaur or a humanoid robot. And in every room, they have this little guy. So there are no light switches or remote controls. You actually do everything by telling this cherry robot, as it's called, turn on the lights, turn off the lights, change channel, order room service, and so on. And finally, we have the recreational robots. Uh, most prevalent are the drones with uh, video. Huge, huge concerns from the public because a lot of people don't want to be filmed necessarily uh, without their knowledge or approval. So there's been a lot of innovation around it. The latest um, Lily drone that will only film you. It will follow a tracker that you wear on your body. And um, Solar Shot, which is a camera stand that would turn around and also follow you as well. And that wraps it up. Muchas gracias. Hasta la vista.